So I have this sketch that I've created for this project and we're gonna start building the set of architectural drawings from that in the computer. So there's a lot of energy in these sketches that oftentimes can get lost in translation uh, to the digital environment. They can feel sort of flat and stale and I'm gonna show you the tricks that I use to sort of circumvent that and you know, not think of it as tedium, something to get through and to get done, uh, but how I use it actually as a design tool. And the key to that lies in this idea of the language of construction. I'll show you the graphical conventions that I use, line weight, shading, color, composition. I'll show you how to lay out a sheet. All of these things that you may not have necessarily been taught. So let's hop into the computer and we're gonna start building this project from the ground up. So I'm gonna start the new drawing here with my drawing template. And this just brings in all of my custom pen settings, all my layers, annotation and dimension styles. And of course the title block for when we get ready to generate the PDF and print this at the end. Custom template is, it's really essential. I mean, you don't wanna to have to create these things from scratch every single time you need them. You don't wanna to have to open up old projects and drawings and copy things in and out. If you wanna download my templates and the title blocks to use as a starting point for customizing your own, I'll leave the links below. So check that out. Now I have drawing checklists in Notion and I'll use those as a final check at the very end, but that's not where I start. I don't just start ticking off these boxes here. I like to think about first principles. So think about Semper's primitive elements of architecture, the enclosure, the mound, the roof, and the hearth. For me, this just reframes the practice of creating these drawings as design oriented rather than task oriented. You know, we're not ticking off boxes on a list, we're making art here, okay? That's how I want you to think about it. So I'll drop in a six foot grid at first, and that's just what I used in my sketches. And then I wanna rough out the perimeter walls, you know, just real basic shapes first. That's how this starts. And this is where the language of construction that I mentioned earlier starts to inform the decision-making. Every line represents a real world material or object. So you wanna start thinking about what each of those are. You know, are these walls made of concrete? Are they made of wood? Are they load bearing? The material properties and the purpose of the walls you're representing are naturally gonna influence their thickness. So I was thinking of these walls as these kind of heavy concrete ramparts. So they're gonna to need to be thick and it would be unusual for a concrete wall to be thinner than eight inches. So I'm gonna draw these as 12 inches thick on the first pass here. Now we can return later to our exterior walls and start layering and building on all these material layers when we know a little bit more about them. You know, for example, if this is a wood framed wall, you know, I'd wanna show the line of stud framing. I'd wanna show the exterior sheathing and the finished thicknesses. And eventually I wanna show the interior finishes. You know, maybe it's open framing or maybe it's plywood. For now, we're just gonna keep it basic. So next we're gonna add in some columns. These kind of count in the enclosure category as well. There's two porch elements. These are supported by these heavy timber columns that I'm imagining and I'm kind of thinking of these as eight by eight members right now. So we'll just drop these on the grid intersections. Now at the media and the kind of bunkhouse volume here, I'm gonna place them inboard of the concrete walls and they're gonna support a lighter wood framed element above. And I may come back and add a few more columns to define the edge of this outdoor space later. We'll just kind of see how that evolves. Now we don't have too many interior partitions here, but just as with the exterior walls, any interior partitions, we want to start thinking about the layering of materials. You know, how is each wall going to be built? So we'd want to draw the interior framing. And then, you know, for this partition wall, let's just put a skin of plywood on it for now. From here, I'll start layering on doors and windows. And I'm starting to think about contrast between these really heavy concrete volumes and maybe some lighter elements. There could be warmer wood interior skins. You know, I'm thinking about some plywoods here. And then maybe there could be these large wood doors. And so I'm drawing these sliding panels with probably a lot more detail than I might normally show because it's helping me to start to think through their construction and how they're actually gonna make the space on the inside feel. So I'm thinking about this smooth concrete contrasted with this kind of heavily textured layered door interior. You know, it could be something really interesting. And then we can start applying this logic to all the other apertures, you know, the hinged doors, the windows, maybe some sliding panels. Now you don't have to add these details everywhere, but by drawing it this way, I'm kind of calling attention to it. I'm flagging it in the plan drawing as being important. And then I'm kind of zooming in and I'm working the problem a little bit. If I think about these doors, I'm drawing the operation of them, you know, for the swinging doors, maybe I'm thinking about like metal tracks that are embedded into the ground plane. And then, you know, we might have a steel wheel that sits at the base of the door and that's what this door rolls on. Maybe there's a huge steel handle or maybe there's some other kind of operation. So if we move on to the windows, we can start 
applying the same logic. You know, I'm drawing a subframe and then I'm going to draw a sash and then I'm going to dash in any operation. You know, maybe they're awning windows, sash kind of opens out and up. Now by showing this, it's helping me to consider how they might relate to the concrete openings, right? Will they be flush or are they going to be inset? You know, how is there a reveal happening at each one of these? And all of this may change as the design develops, but drawing it here at this very early stage kind of helps me to push the design forward. So this is a good time to talk about line weight. It's probably the most important thing you can focus on if you want to improve your drawings. And you'll notice that I've been doing this all along as I've been drawing. I adjust the thickness of almost every line in the drawing as I go. And this creates contrast and just makes the floor plan more legible. You can imagine if everything had the same visual weight on the page, it's going to look really flat. We wouldn't know where to look. And ultimately, that's going to be really difficult to read. So line weight is so important that the layers in my drawing template are set according to line weight. So if you need a heavy line, it's just going to go on the heavy layer and that's going to assign it a heavier line weight. If you need a light line, that's going to go on the light layer and so on. Now I use the heavy layer to outline anything that I'm cutting through. Remember a floor plan is just horizontal cut at the four foot level through a building. So the wall outline here, this perimeter is going to be the heaviest. So that's kind of the first pass. You know, I'm going to choose all of these cut areas and create a really heavy, thick boundary. And then we're going to move down the scale. So I'm going to think about medium weight lines. Maybe these are for floor edges or they're going to outline any sort of prominent masses in the plan. Uh, changes in elevation, maybe island edges or cabinetry perimeters. And then we have the light lines for everything else. And I have several different versions of light lines. I have like an extra fine and a super fine. And you don't have to get that granular if you don't want to, uh, but it's just helpful to start thinking about these line weights from that real gradation of heavy to super fine. One caveat here is you don't want to use the very heavy lines very close to each other. You'll just end up with one solid thick mass. You know, you create contrast by placing very light lines next to the very heavy lines. And this just helps you to preserve all the detail that you're drawing. Now, if that weren't enough, we have different line types that you can use too. And for this, I just try to keep a real small number. So I'm primarily using dashed or hidden lines of varying thicknesses and opacities to show say overhead planes or I'm, you know, indicating tracks for sliding doors or door swings. And sometimes I'll use dotted lines for very fine detail. And then of course, center lines for things like our structural column bays or our grid bays. Now, honestly, many of your decisions about line weight, it's just going to come down to your artistic eye, which you're going to continue to develop over time. And remember too, that lines don't have to be a hundred percent opaque. So if you look at my drawings and you're seeing a lot of shading and variation and gradient, that's because I'm using screened lines and I actually use them almost everywhere in my drawings. So screened lines are just lines with varying opacities. Now there's one layer I haven't touched on yet and that's the hatch layer. So to create even more depth in the drawings here, you're going to use hatch patterns and toning. And I use a lot of these in my plans. Now the general convention for new construction is to poche or fill in all these exterior walls with a solid hatch. And then for any existing walls, you would keep those open. This way you can tell the difference between existing and new. Now the poche you see in these plans is pretty heavy, right? But notice how you can still see all of the framing and the interstitial lines, all these material lines we've been talking about. These are all visible in the wall cavity. So you don't want this turning into one big muddy mess. So you can play with the opacity here and go from a really light, say 10% all the way up to maybe an 80%. Just make sure you keep those lines visible in the wall. Now I use shading of varying opacities on cabinetry. I use it on counter surfaces. I'll sometimes use it on stairs. For hatching, my rule is just pretty loose and it actually changes depending on the drawing. So that's, I know that's not a great guideline, but generally any material I want to show is prominent or really important. I'm just going to add a tone or a hatch to it. Now the floorboards you see here in this plan, these are actually not hatches. They're drawn as detailed planks. And I'm doing this because I'm developing this design idea of a layering of materials inside of these concrete volumes. So you can see the framing members, they're kind of set on the concrete and those framing members, I just kind of faked out with a thick screened polyline. And then I drew the boards on top and then I hatched the concrete surface for the whole thing below. And you can see the kind of depth that this achieves. Now again, here at color toning, I use it really sparingly. So you can see I've added some color tone on these wood elements. And I've added a little bit on the pool and, you know, some furniture pieces. And the goal here isn't to be hyper realistic. I just wanted to help my clients read the drawings better. 
So as we're building this, we've got our enclosure pretty well defined. Now we're going to move on to the site. You know, the site is a really important influence for architecture. So I'm going to bring in any local topography or any, you know, prominent vegetation, and I'm going to set them on a super fine layer. And this is using a hidden screened line type. So really subtle, right? The more you zoom in, the more you can appreciate what this is. And it's, it's going to influence how we're entering the space and how we're adapting to the local topography. So I like to think about this kind of push and pull between the site and the building. How are we manipulating the ground plane? And how are the site forces, how are they influencing the design? And this push and pull, you'll see here, it kind of means that in some places there's an organic edge to the boundary, and then in others there's this really hard delineation. So in this phase, I'm gonna start showing you know, site stairs, I'm gonna show decks, terraces, any floor planes, maybe some water features. And of course, if there's retaining walls, we wanna get those all blocked in here too. And this is another chance for us to start layering on these tones and hatches and using screened line types. You can see I've added a light blue wash for the water element and just kind of a few ripples to the hatch. You know, you can add some character to these drawings. They, they shouldn't feel flat and lifeless. You know, the goal is to add, give them some personality. Now for me, Semper's version of the hearth is a proxy for human habitation. And it's just a chance for us to layer in details, which force you as the designer, as the architect, to acknowledge all these daily patterns in life. So yes, we actually have a literal hearth in this design. It happens to be this fire pit, kind of this central gathering space. But you know, if we take this idea to its logical conclusion, the hearth includes things like furniture, fittings, and equipment, all the accessories of living, right? Now, if design is about inventing solutions, I think one of the best ways to really leverage your drawing practice as a design tool is to begin inventing solutions, kind of what we've been doing all along here. And I want you to think about all the possibilities latent in the design that are related to human habitation. You know, I want you to think about hardware, joinery, fasteners, how things operate, what do the materials feel like, how does water move off the roof? How does wind and sound affect the experience? You know, what's this, what does it smell like to be there? You know, each of these is really a chance to dig in and invent a response in this, even its early stage of design. When you study the work of the greats, like Carlos Scarpa comes to mind here, uh, you understand that architectural drawings are representational tools. They're meant to be built from, but they're also design tools. When I think I'm done, I'm going to zoom out and I'm going to squint. And the most important features of your drawing, they should have the strongest visual weight. So here, it's probably the pochade walls, right? If you zoom out and squint. As I zoom in, then I want to be able to see more and more detail. And to continue building that, we're gonna talk about annotations, dimensions, and laying out the sheet next.